the author started from a criticism of waterfall style approaches that is justified, but it's not a reason to swing to the other extreme, which is just as bad. I'd like to start with the ugly of agile, as you called it. You list these 10 things. And what I did in my book was not to, uh, I think it was one of the first books to take an objective view. You know, I don't have any uh, horses in this uh, race. I want to help people by telling them uh, how to improve their software process. And in particular, given that there's been so much buzz around the agile uh, message to tell them, to help them choose between the uh, what's good and what's not good for them. So could you maybe give some more details of your thoughts of the first one, deprecation of upfront requirements and designs? One of the worst pieces of advice that one gets from the dogmatic uh, agile uh, proponents is this idea that you shouldn't have any front work. You know, the, the term used to deprecate this is analysis paralysis, right? You spend so much time analyzing the problem that you don't have any time and resource, you don't have enough uh, time and resources left to do what uh, agile people consider to be the real work, which is to implement the stuff. And what's often the case in, in agile ideas is that they often start from a criticism of traditional uh, waterfall style approaches, a criticism that is justified, okay? But it's not a reason to uh, have a swing of the pendulum to the other extreme. So they start from this criticism and go all the way to the other extreme, where, and, and, they, and they, which is just as bad. And so this idea that you should not spend uh, time uh, thinking about the requirements and uh, design uh, at all, and you should just kind of, uh, you know, in a kind of uh, a dogmatic application of Scrum, uh, start producing user stories and implementing them. This is an absolute catastrophe. Okay, and the word catastrophe is the appropriate one. Uh, I've seen just too many projects in which people say, oh, we don't need to, to do any initial requirements, uh, we are agile, we, uh, we just uh, throw in your user stories and, and start to implement them. And of course, uh, initially it kind of sounds good because you, you have something to show right away. So a few, a few people say, yes, well, that's great, it's going the right direction. And then six months later, you realize that you have this collection of completely unrelated pieces of code uh, with no architecture, no overall uh, uh, concept behind them and the project fails. It's just as simple as that. And so and this is explained in more detail in the book after, in, in my newest book, the book about requirements, which has some ideas for a modern coherent uh, software process. What, what, what's needed is a the solution that retains the best of the traditional approaches and the agile approaches. The agile people are right that at some point you should stop analysis and, and actually do it, get into it. But that point is not t equals zero. It's, it's a little later than t equals zero. So the right approach is to spend just enough time at the beginning to do the overall upfront requirements, overall upfront design. And then at some point you stop, even though it's not necessarily complete, it's not necessarily perfect, and you start doing it. And then you go back to the design, you go back to requirements, and then you go back to coding, and then back to the upfront work and so on. This is the right way to, to do things. But the, um, the advice not to do any uh, large scale upfront uh, requirements and design is uh, akin to uh, professional malpractice. It's the worst uh, advice that can ever be given to a software development team. User stories as a basis for requirements. The idea that you should, that you can base your uh, user stories, uh, that you can use your user stories as the sole source of requirements is, is just ridiculous. I mean, it's uh, a, a user story is just one case of uh, a scenario of usage through the system. So you can accumulate as many of them as uh, you like. Uh, they are not going to give you requirements. Requirements in a serious system requires abstraction. User stories do not have any abstraction. I uh, want to make sure that there is a two-factor authentication. Okay, great, but uh, that is just one piece of information and you can accumulate uh, 2,000 pieces of such information they're interesting, but they don't give you an overall picture. In order to build a good system in any engineering discipline, not just software, 
you know, but software in particular, you need a you need a global view, and you, the stories are not going to give you this. You know? So you know, the user story about protecting the integrity of your site is closely connected with the user story about a customer going through the system and paying for a product. And so, so for this, you need something else, more abstract, more high level than user stories. That is very easy to for agile people to say traditional requirements uh, techniques are too boring, too uh, take too much time, they're, they're too general and so on. Jo just have user stories and do it. Okay, unfortunately it's wrong. It's just wrong because reality is complex and you need, like in any engineering discipline, you need to analyze the problem uh, at a higher level uh, be before going into this and that user story. So user stories like use cases. I mean, you know, what I'm saying about user stories largely applies to use cases as well. They're very good at tests, you know, as ways to check your requirements. But as a substitute for requirements, they're really a recipe for disaster. Now the third one, feature-based development and ignorance of dependencies. What are your thoughts on that? Well, it's it, this is perhaps a, partly a repetition of the previous one. That is to say, you know, many people advocate building feature by feature, which is appealing at first, but then you run into the same problem that I uh, just mentioned of uh, the dependencies uh, between the various features. If you find this video informative, be sure to subscribe for new content and give this video a thumbs up. So the next one, reject the dependency tracking tools, but there is a certain Luddite uh, attitude sometimes of rejecting uh, tools and things that are too sophisticated and saying, well, it's just the programmers uh, who know how to do their job, just leave them, uh, leave them alone. A rejection of traditional manager tasks. In the Scrum world, there's no actual notion of manager, and in particular, the role of uh, deciding who does what is assigned to the team as a whole. In other variants of the uh, Agile uh, methodology, like extreme programming, like uh, lean software by the pop and DX, they all agree that there shouldn't be a manager in the, in the traditional sense. Yeah. So it, in, in practice, it's not applied. I mean, the companies I know all, all, uh, who, apply, who are supposed to apply Agile methods still uh, openly or not uh, have a manager because it's the way the world uh, works is much better. To, uh, for the for agile approaches to be more realistic, to accept that there is going to be a manager because this is how company structures are organized, and then define the roles of the role of the manager in a more appropriate way. I mean, there are some good ideas. The idea is that you should have some kind of coach, some kind of mentor, and so on is is very good. So, but, but rejecting the traditional manager uh, tasks is pointless because they're going to happen anyway. All right, number six. This one is important, I think. Traditional software engineering textbooks, including mine, uh, advocate for both extendability and reusability, both of which have to do with generalizations. And people like Ron Jeffries say, well, this is a myth. You're chasing uh, um, shadows because you don't know in what direction is going to be uh, generalized. Do uh, build a product that you'll be asked to build exactly that and not an inch more or not. And, you know, as always, in Agile, I mentioned this already, they, they start from a sometimes valid criticism and they can they take, it, take it too far. It, but in practice, when you've built something, in my experience, you have a pretty good idea of what its limitations are and, and of how you could remove these limitations to make it more general so that the next time is similar not identical, but similar problem comes around, you could reuse it. So uh, th this is this is a bad idea to, to reject extendability and, and reusability. The good idea is to say, don't try to be perfect in terms of extendability and reusability and, and generalization because you don't quite know. Sure, don't try to be perfect, but it doesn't mean that you should build just the product that is being re requested, which is really a very bad engineering that is because much of the um, much, of, much of good software engineering uh, has to do with indeed uh, producing stuff that is extendable and reusable. Uh, number seven, embedded customer. So the, the general goal common to all variants of the agile approach to, to all agile methods, one, one common idea they all have uh, is to say that we should put customers at the center and the uh, stream programming approach already back 20 years ago said the way to do it is to take 
a member of the uh, customer organization and uh, make him or her a part of the team. It just doesn't work in practice for several reasons. Let me mention uh, a couple. One is that you, one obvious one is that you get only one customer. Okay? And so that person uh, has uh, he, his or her pet peeves and uh, the preferences, and uh, he is a representative of one of the customer organizations. So you get one viewpoint, and that's not what you want. You want various uh, view, uh, viewpoints. So that's, that's, that is uh, one obstacle. The second, the second obstacle is that most, most of the time this guy or gal is going to be bored. I mean, it's you know, software development takes a long time and it's a, much of it for, especially for people who are not part of the profession can be very boring. I mean, you have bugs, you, you fix the bugs, you, you run tests and so on. So uh, let's say you have, you're building an accounting system or a text processing system, your, your experts in accounting or your expert in the text processing is going to to you to get to be bored much of the time, and you well, what do they actually have to do? And the third reason I'll stop at I'll stop at number three. The third reason why this is, this does not work in practice is that uh, you're not go going to get the best person anyway, because you know if you have the best representative of a customer organization, uh, that guy or gal is probably very much in demand because he is an expert. They are an expert in in, in their own field, and the company is not going to give them to you for six months or one year to be embedded in your in your team doing nothing for the else for the for the company so who am I, whom are they going to give you they're going to give you someone who maybe has a big mouth you know is expressing opinions all, all, all the time and uh, getting a lot of attention they are indispensable to the organization uh, the organization is never going to yield them to you so it doesn't it, 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 it just doesn't work i mean and what has superseded it is the crime idea of a product owner okay the idea that you have someone who is the official representative of the uh, customer team and uh, also very importantly able to make decisions and, and commit the uh, customer company so uh, the, the, this is the modern version of the embedded customer it works much better yeah, I like I like that in the beginning. You said it's a seductive concept, and it is. It would be amazing if customers with the requisite skills were willing to spend that kind of time yeah. with uh, a vendor. It has not happened one single time in my career. Not once. It's never will. Never will. They're too important. They're too busy. But they will judge us based off of whether the software ends up delighting them or not. The next one, coach has a separate role. And in, in Scrum, which has really, in many respects, taken over the Agile uh, world by essentially uh, integrating some of the best ideas from uh, other Agile approaches, it's called it's the Scrum Master. So this is very dangerous. You know, what I've seen in, uh, in software development projects is that it's very dangerous to to have people who are just advisors and they are no responsibility for the result. And this is always very uh, dangerous uh, because uh, you want people who have responsibility for the final product. In, in particular, you know, the Scrum Master in Scrum is not supposed to develop any software by uh, himself or herself. And I think this is a really terrible idea because if you are, if you're just giving advice, you're not really into it. I mean, so my experience of software development is that in uh, apart maybe from a manager in a traditional role anyone who is deeply involved in the software including a technical manager uh, and certainly a coach or uh, the equivalent of a, a scrum master should actually uh, roll up his or her sleeves and uh, and build software if you're not, if you're not actually building at least uh, some elements of the software, then, you, then um, you, you're not really qualified to, to give advice. And even the very the old uh, idea of going back to the uh, 70s, probably everyone has followed, has um, forgotten this uh, by now. But it was this idea of the chief programmer chief programmer team by Helen Mills. You know, the chief programmer team was like the general who who goes first into battle, right? And uh, he, he's not just in his operational post uh, 2,000 uh, kilometers from, from the front line uh, telling people to do this or to do that. He, he's part of the 
Uh, he's part of the team and uh, like, I mean, uh, along with everyone else. But in my experience, this is a much better approach. Now the next one, test-driven development. At some level, it's intellectually attractive. Of course, in practice, it doesn't make sense. I mean, who is going to uh, to develop software like this? I've not seen people actually use this. In safely, the original uh, Ken Beck description of TDD, test-driven development, as mm -hmm. a software development process uh, methodology is that people don't do TDD as far as I can uh, observe. There is a rule which I think every software project should apply without any exception whatsoever, which is that every piece of functionality in the system in the software should have an associated test. Okay? Uh, you, you, you shouldn't even think about having a piece of functionality that does not have a test associated with it. So this is certainly what we do in our own practice. Of course, it doesn't have... So yeah, in this test, in practice, so personally, as a project manager, I don't really care whether the test was written first and then the piece of code to implement it or the other way around, which actually sounds more reasonable because you want to abstract, you, 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 you want to think about your code. But then, of course, they are missing a fundamental aspect, uh, which is contracts, okay? you don't, uh, a specification. So for every piece of code, uh, there should be not two, but three things, the code, the test, in the contract, you know, the precondition, the postcondition, the, the uh, for the class as a whole, the uh, class invariant. So this is what uh, you know, ninety-nine percent of the world uh, misses, uh, and they can use all the agile techniques that they like. And so test-driven test-driven development should really yield to a contract-driven development. And um, then it starts making sense. But once again, uh, there too, I'm not particularly dogmatic. What I do know is that every piece of software should have three elements going together, the test, the code, and the contract. And I don't care that much because I'm pragmatic in which order they are written. I do care that they all appear in the final version of the system. Okay. So the next one, deprecation of documents. And so I think this is most visible in the uh, Lean Software variant or branch or school. school so most of say explicitly that one should only work on artifacts that are going to be delivered to the customer. And what do we deliver to the customer? We deliver the code and uh, the tests. And everything else is what they call waste. So the term waste comes from industrial engineering, and in particular from methods that have been developed over the past few decades, in the, starting with Toyota in the automobile industry, to uh, improve industrial production by minimizing various forms of weight, such as inventory, communication issues, and so on. And so they apply the same idea to the software, and for them, documentation is just one form of waste. Who needs design documents? Who needs uh, diagrams uh, and uh, and so on. it's very easy to produce wonderful documents so you know you can cover all the walls of your uh, office uh, with uh, a wonderful uh, uml uh, diagrams and other documents and so on it's it, it's not code i mean uh, the, the only the thing that actually works or doesn't work is code the thing that if it works is going to bring money to the company and if it doesn't work is going to ruin your career that's actually code. So all this is true, but it doesn't mean that we should throw away the baby with the bathwater, that we should throw away all the documents. So in any engineering discipline, uh, you, you need to, to describe what you're doing, to plan what you're doing, to project and estimate what, you, what you're doing, including uh, numerically and you know, quantitatively. And this is just good engineering practice. So. It's another example of a valid criticism that is taken too far with a swing of the pendulum that goes to the other extreme and that other extreme is not defensible. Dr. Meyer has also shared insightful views on the hype of Agile. I highly recommend watching that video too.